Well, good morning, Red Cedar Church. My name is Chad Laux. I am the next-gen pastor here, and I have the honor today of uh, giving the sermon, preaching God's word to you today. I thought today I would wear my Rice Lake High School swag because if you are unaware, the Rice Lake High School football team are state champions. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Fourth quarter, fourth down, uh, fake the punt, run for a first down to clinch the win. It was absolutely epic game. Way to win a state championship. Congratulations, Rice Lake Warriors. We're super excited and proud of you guys. Your hard work and your dedication have paid off. We are in week three of our sermon series called Cultivating Kingdom Impact. And today we're going to talk about relationships and God, relationships and God. God, throughout the years, has blessed me with some amazing relationships. And I want to share a little bit about those uh, here this morning as we start things off. Next to my salvation in Jesus, next to the relationship I have with God, the greatest relationship God has given me is the relationship I have with my wife, Rachel. We've been married for 13 years. She is an absolute joy to be married with. It's crazy for me to think about that when we first got married, I remember uh, that week as we were making final preparations for our wedding day, having the thought in my head of, okay, hey, this is it. This is the most I will probably ever love my wife because we're, new, we're gonna be newlyweds. We're super excited about this. We're young, we're naive. I felt my heart was absolute full of love for my wife. But the crazy thing for me is when I think about it is over the last 13 years, we have not lost weight, right? We've gone the other, the other direction, right? The elasticity in our skin hasn't increased. We have more wrinkles as time has gone on, right? Uh, the color of our hair has not uh, gotten darker. It's gotten lighter. Yet my love for my wife has only grown deeper and richer as those 13 years have gone on. When I think of my wife, Rachel, uh, when I think of her, she is light in a dark place. She is warmth in a cold place. And I am so blessed to not only be married to someone who's my best friend that I love spending time with, that I love talking to, uh, but to have a, a partner in life as we navigate the craziness of life, but then also to be married to somebody that I really, really look up to. She is an absolute joy for me to be, be married to. Another relationship that God has blessed me with in an amazing way is the relationship I have with my parents. So my mom and dad, praise the Lord, are both still living. This past summer, they just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, which is just absolutely amazing. I'm super close with them. I, they live in northern Indiana, and whenever we're able to spend time with each other, uh, we do. They're going to be driving up here to spend the, the week leading up to Christmas with us. We're super excited about that. And what's interesting to me is as the years have gone on, my relationship with my dad has always been good, uh, but we've become more and more friends as the, as the years have gone on. If he tells me to do something, I'll still say, yes, sir, um, right away, sir. Uh, but we're, we're still friends, we're growing closer in our friendship as the years have gone on. My dad is 70, all right? And uh, just last night and a lot of nights after the kids go to bed and, and Rachel and I you know, talk shop and we get everything squared away for the night, we'll get on Xbox and play together right, online, and he's 70. I think that's super cool. Um, it's a lot of fun to be able to be able to play video games with my dad. Uh, we have a great relationship. And one other relationship I want to share with you that God has blessed me with is long-lasting friendships through uh, my friends Brad and Justin. Brad and I became best friends in, in sixth grade, and we added Justin into the mix in eighth grade. And throughout high school, we were able to hold each other accountable. We went to church together. Uh, we challenged each other. We encouraged each other. And now it's, it's absolutely amazing what God does in the lives of other people. And in the years ahead, I'm sure I'll share this story with you uh, later, but it's amazing to think that uh, Justin is a pastor in White Cloud, Michigan. Uh, Brad is a pastor in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I'm blessed to be a pastor here in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. And uh, to this day, we call each other for prayer, for encouragement, for advice, uh, for accountability. And God has just blessed me with amazing relationships as time goes on. And I say that because I know that uh, our key idea for today, what I'm going to challenge you with today, is this. My challenge is to cultivate a living faith that loves God and loves others well. If you listen to the word of God today, if you listen to what's going to be shared from God's word, 
then you can expect joy beyond your wildest dreams, love deeper than you could ever imagine, contentment beyond comprehension. But if you ignore God's word today and you choose not to live it out, you can expect despair beyond your wildest dreams, hatred deeper than you could ever imagine, misery beyond comprehension. Because if you get what God is gonna share with you today, if you get the words of Jesus today, then you get it all. If you understand this, then you understand it all. But if you miss this, then you miss it all. Our scripture for today comes from Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 34, and it says this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is most important? So essentially, he's asking to like summarize the whole Bible, right? So you're gonna wanna pay attention to this, right? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions questions. This text shares with, shares with us three big cultivation tools that I wanted to talk to you about today that are needed to grow a living faith that actively loves God and loves others well. And the first cultivation tool is to keep God first. It's to keep God first. This text reads, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the first Christians were surrounded by by Roman temples that worshiped and sacrificed to the Roman gods, such as Jupiter, Juno, Neptune, Mars, Venus, Apollo, just to name a few. And the, but the Roman people themselves considered themselves to be very religious. Their relationship with God was not based on grace, but was based on a very practical, contractual basis. It was based on the principle of, I give that you might give back in return. And the Roman emperors themselves considered themselves to be deity. In contrast, the the early Christians lived a completely counter-cultural life. In fact, the early Christians were accused of atheism because they only believed in one God. They didn't worship the Roman gods. And the idea of worshiping only one God was so foreign to them that the Romans had a hard time wrapping their head around it. In our time and now, I wonder, though, what does it mean to live this out. What does it mean to say the Lord our God, the Lord is one? Because most of us are not surrounded by Roman temples, right? We're not surrounded by temples that worship polytheism. But I wonder if we pause and reflected to see if we've given into a casual polytheism ourselves, if we've slipped into allowing other things in our life to be on the same par as God. If God is one, have we raised other things to be at that same level as God? I see uh, far too often, and it's a, definitely a struggle for a lot of men, where they find their identity in their occupation. Uh, where, the, where they're at, uh, their, their identity, the foundation of who they are is on the same level as God is their occupation. Some of us form our identity around that. Other, it might be a relationship Some of us form our identity around possessions. Some of us form our identity around the occupation or a skill. And I know this because years ago, I had somebody I was working with and at a a small company who had been there for, worked at this job for decades and decades and decades, right? And he was always the first one at work. He was the last one to leave. On his days off, you would often find him there at the office. Rarely ever took a vacation. 
And when he got up in years and management saw that it was time to transition him out, uh, pretty much against his will, and as he retired, his identity was taken from him. And when you don't have an identity uh, on something that's solid and it's taken from you, his life very much crumbled to the extreme point that shortly after he left uh, his job there, he took his own life. When we base our identity on something that can be taken from you, when it is taken from you, your whole world will crumble. We need God as our firm foundation because it is the only solid foundation. Never base your identity, never base your foundation on something that can be taken from you. First cultivation tool is we need to keep God first. We need to keep God first. The second cultivation tool that we can take away from this text is for us to be wholly devoted to God. Uh, For the parents in the room, so I'm the next-gen pastor. I get to oversee all of our family ministry, which is a blessing for me. So if you're, if you're a parent in the room, uh, pay extra close attention to what I'm going to say. In the passage that we read in Mark, Jesus quotes two Old Testament passages, and one is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. 4 through 9 reads this, and parents pay extra close attention because this gives us a roadmap for how to instill a legacy of faith in our children. Okay, so pay extra close attention. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Okay, how am I supposed to do that? It says this. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Uh, Parents, you need to know your influence. You need to know your influence. Uh, Doug Fields, a youth ministry guru, and he's written an amazing parenting book called Intentional Parenting, uh, writes about and speaks about this idea of the order of influence in the life of a child. Uh, The number one influence in the life of a child is their parent, number one. Number one is their parent. Uh, number two is a non-parental adult. So uh, if you're a grandparent in the room, that's you, okay? That's you. If you're a teacher, if you're a coach, if you're a volunteer in RC Kids, that's you, right? Second biggest influence in the life of a kid is a non-parental adult. The third are their peers. Third are their peers. Nobody will have more influence in the life of a kid then parents, second is a non-parental adult, and third are their peers. Parents, we need to be extra cautious about the friends that our kids have in their life, the, the friends that we allow to influence the life of our kids. I tell uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers whenever I have a chance uh, this, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. If you hang around with a bunch of kids that take school really seriously, that are respectful to their teachers and work really hard, then you are much more likely to take school very seriously, to be respectful to your teachers and to work really hard. If you hang around with a bunch of kids that skip school and run into the bathroom in between periods to vape, you are much more likely to skip class and to vape, right? Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Parents, we gotta be really intentional about who we allow to influence our kids and our third and the fourth influence in the life of a kid is culture. Parents, I want to leave that up for a little while. You need to know that you are the primary faith former in the family. The church can help. We can help you. But the raising of our children in the Christian faith cannot be outsourced. Parents must take the lead. Unfortunately, I see on a regular basis parents treating faith in a similar fashion as how they treat an extracurricular activity, right? So let's take football, for example, right? You take your kids to football practice, you drop them off. They practice for an hour, hour and a half. They develop this skill. They come home, and you very well may never play football with them. You may never well talk to them about football, but they still develop this skill. It doesn't work like that with our faith. You can't drop your kids off at the church for one hour or two hours a week, 
and expect them to grow in faith in amazing ways in a similar way because it's different. Because when it comes to discipleship, life lessons are more caught than taught. We can teach them here on the weekends, but remember, who's the primary influence in the life of kids? Parents are. When they look at you, when your kids look at you, they're watching all the time. They look at you, and they see, oh, that's how a husband is supposed to treat a wife. Oh, that's how a wife is supposed to talk to a husband. Oh, that's how much time I should spend scrolling on my phone. Oh, that's what my relationship to alcohol should look like. Oh, that's how I should act when I'm angry. It's a wake-up call for me sometimes when I'm sitting at the dinner table and I see my son frustrated and I hear him talking to his sisters. I hear his tone. I hear his words. I look at him and I know exactly where he learned that from. From his mother. No, that's from me. That's from me. 100% me. Sometimes I'm sitting there at the dinner table and I look at him and it's, it's, it's a rude awakening because it's like looking into a mirror of, yep, I know where he got that phrase. Yep, I know where he got that tone. It's from me. Life lessons are more caught than taught. Parents, you need to know your influence. If you want to create a legacy of faith in your home, then kids must see faith lived out by their parents. Grandparents don't check out here. Right? If you're heavily involved in the life of kids, you can have influence in their life too. Parents, grandparents, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Just be intentional and faithful as you live out the faith. And a big thing too is to own up to your mistakes. Right? None of us are perfect. Right? When we mess up, own up to it. Right? It's, it's a great example for us of when you are too harsh with your spouse, when you're too, when you're too harsh with your kids, after you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit and you've calmed down, to then talk to them and say, hey, what I said was wrong. I should not have lashed out to you like that. Hey, that's not how a husband is supposed to talk to a wife. Uh, and I need you guys to know that. And apologize in front of your kids. You're setting the example for them of how to find reconciliation. Also, having a positive, having regular positive faith-based conversations is essential to creating a legacy of faith. So my challenge to you is to see routine as opportunities. Routine as opportunities around meal times, bedtimes. When you're driving in a vehicle, you got a captive audience. They're not going anywhere. Family fun days, holidays, family trips, all of those are regular opportunities for you to instill faith in your children, to have those regular faith-based conversation. They're extremely important. Seeing the ordinary as opportunities for discipleship. So kind of reviewing that section there, who is to instill faith in the lives of children? Number one, it's parents. Where are we to train and teach kids about the way of God in the home? And what are we supposed to teach them? These words of Jesus that we read earlier from Mark, to love God and to love others well. The third cultivation tool that I want to talk about today is to love others well. And it's interesting, of all the commandments, right, of when Jesus looks at, at the whole Bible, why does he summarize these two things? Why does he say to love God with everything you have and then to love your neighbor as yourself? Why does he say to love God and to love others? Why do those two things go hand in hand? Listen to me closely with this, right? It's because this is the reason. Because you f can't fully love your neighbor unless you love God. And if you're not loving your neighbor, then you're not loving God. Let me unpack that a little bit. When you enter into a relationship with God, you are being transformed by God. Our relationship with God, the grace of God, the transformative work that God does in our lives is what allows us to fully love in the first place. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit. We have the ability to love only because of the work of God in our lives. So in order for us to love our neighbor, we have to love God. And then, since we love God, God teaches us several things about his creation. 
He teaches us that every human being is made in the image of God. He teaches us that God wants us that God wants to be in a relationship with everyone. He teaches us that Christ died for everyone, that our fellow human being is a creation of God and human life is of the greatest value. So the way you treat creation reflects the way you feel about the creator. And you might say, well, you know, I, I, I love God. I, I really do, but I'm just, you know, it's just my personality. I'm really harsh. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of naturally harsh with other people. Well, brace yourself. Uh, First John chapter four, 19 through 21 says this. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And there's so many great ways that we can show love to others. And even though we live in this fallen world by the grace of God who gives us the ability to love in the first place, God also gives us a mechanism, a way for us to stay in love with others, to have right relationship with other people. And even though we're being transformed by God, we still make mistakes. The way we stay in right relationship with other people is through reconciliation. Reconciliation. So I want to give you three keys, three keys to reconciliation this morning. First is to own up to your mistakes. Own up to your mistakes of being honest and saying, hey, I was wrong. What I said was out of line. Own up to your mistakes. The second is to apologize, to apologize sincerely. Apologize sincerely. Something I've learned over the years is that you can either apologize or you can defend yourself. You can't do both. Because once you start defending yourself, it's no longer an apology. I'm sorry I acted that way, but you know how I am before I had my morning coffee. I'm sorry I said that, but I had a really harsh day at work. I'm sorry I snapped at you, but you were just nagging me, right? Either you can apologize or defend yourself. If you're going to apologize sincerely, there's no buts. I was out of line. What I did was wrong. I'm sorry. And the third key to reconciliation is to be humble, is to be humble. Uh, something I learned too is that usually when there's conflict, rarely, it does happen, uh, but rarely is it 100% somebody else, the other person's fault, right? Usually, we have a part to play in it. It might just be 10% of it, uh, but to own up to your part, to recognize that you have contributed to this conflict is a part of being humble. And when you go and apologize, when you own up to your mistakes and apologize sincerely, they might not be ready to forgive you. They might see that as an opportunity to vent. They might need time to process what you have said. They might not be ready to forgive you instantly. And to go into that with humility, recognizing that and knowing that. As Christians, we need to be masters at reconciliation. We need to be masters at it. 